So good evening, and welcome to the latest installment of the Slack Public Lectures. Tonight, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce one of my colleagues, uh, Tom Shutt, from the uh, astrophysics and particle astrophysics group here at Slack. Uh, Tom got his PhD from Berkeley in 1993, and in the early 90s, he participated in some of the pioneering efforts to discover the identity of the dark matter of the universe. And um, he's been working on it ever since. He went to Princeton as an assistant professor, and while he was there, he investigated atomic xenon as a great uh, element to capture dark matter. And through his efforts and various collaborations that he's been in, this has now become a very important technology in this search. He went off to a professorship at Case Western Reserve, where he worked with Dan Akarib on one of the largest xenon detectors of dark matter, um, the Lux experiment. And very recently, uh, Dan and Tom came here uh, to work with Slack in scaling this up to what really we hope will be the ultimate detector of dark matter. So he's going to tell you this story tonight, why where dark matter, why we know there's dark matter, where it comes from, what it might be, how we might find it. The story isn't over, but that part of the story that we know about, you'll hear tonight. So thank you very much. Here's Tom. Thank you, Michael. And um, it's a pleasure to be here to tell you about this, uh, I think, very interesting story, um, looking for dark matter. Uh, the story starts, well, might as well start it way back at the beginning um, with Newton, who sort of gave birth to physics. And yes, there's an equation. It's the only equation in the talk. I figure most of you probably have seen this in high school, right? This is, this is the force of gravity, uh, say, with the Earth and something that would orbit the Earth and the distance from the center of the Earth to the thing. And then on this side is the, well, I shouldn't call it this, but the centrifugal force the tension, the tendency of the body to move straight. And this is a nice, interesting thing. Back, back, back in Newton, this is in, from Principia, he uh, has this nice little diagram. He imagines throwing a ball, throwing it harder, throwing it harder still, and then doing that on a mountain. And if you throw it at the right, dist at the right speed, determined by this velocity, uh, this equation then tells you that the thing can be perfectly balanced and it'll go in an orbit, okay? Um, I like to think of this as weighing the Earth. Um, the little mass on either side drops out, and I can rearrange this equation once someone measures G, which happened at some point. Um, and if you know V and R, you measured the mass of the Earth. So Newton in 1670s came up with equations which basically mean we can weigh the Earth. You might think, well, how could I ever weigh the Earth? Can I put it on a scale? And the answer is no, of course not. This is how we know the mass of the Earth. Well, we know the mass of the Sun this way too. Um, here's the distance out from the, uh, from out to a planet. The Earth is here at one in these units. And this is the speed at which the planets are moving. And here's a graph. And this uh, one over R just pops out of, um, uh, the, the velocity is dropping like one over the distance that's popping out exactly from that equation. And the data and the, and the, and the, um, and the, um, and the theory match beautifully. In fact, People have tested just Newton's um, equation of gravity on an incredible range of scales. Um, precise measurements with little, essentially, you know, kind of almost quantum masses on, 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 on fancy springs have measured down to less than a millimeter scale and seen that the Newton's law works. And this distance is billions of miles. And one, one equation describes it beautifully. Um, it allows us to, you know, fly satellites, dock satellites, all sorts of things. Remarkable thing that, you know, the universe is mathematical and has, you know, succumbed to our, our understanding of mathematics. Didn't have to be that way. Okay, so let's jump out to a larger scale, a galaxy. This is a nice, pretty galaxy. Uh, the only point is that it's sort of a spirally thing and it's, it's indeed, it's rotating, okay? Um, in fact, you can measure that it's rotating, although it's a little bit difficult. 
People started measuring galaxies, how they're rotating. What you do is you see them edge on and you see Doppler shift. Things coming at you on one side are blue shifted and moving away from you are red shifted. And so starting around the 70s, these measurements became solid. And this curve here, there's a bunch of curves, I apologize. This is a bit busy, but it's important. So this curve here is the analog of the last curve. Um, a galaxy is not a simple mass in the center. If all of the mass in the galaxy were right at the center, this would be a curve exactly like in the last, in the last, um, in the last graph. But it's a little different. There's mass kind of distributed everywhere. This is the prediction for how fast things are rotating around this galaxy, depending on how far out they are. And this is the speed again. Um, if all that was there was the stuff you see, i.e. the stars. That's a, that, this data is from that galaxy and you see stars. And you see, actually there's a lot of gas and dust. It e easily equals the stars. But the data points are here, these circles. Way out here, in, oh, and by the way, the visible part ends about here. What's going on out here are there gas clouds that the astronomers have figured out are indeed associated with that galaxy and they're orbiting. Way out here, where in fact you just run out of gas clouds to measure, the velocity is substantially higher than that predicted by this curve. And you think, eh, is this really a problem? Is this not really a problem? There was a big debate, essentially, when I was in grad school. Is this a problem? Is this not a problem? And it was finally kind of firmly decided, no, no, this is a problem. Hundreds of the galaxies, in fact, at this point, thousands have been measured, and they all have this problem. We can go to a bigger scale still. Galaxies in the universe aren't typically found alone. They're in clusters. So this is a nice photo you see in yellow, a cluster of a set of galaxies. They're all kind of clustered together. They're sort of mutually gravitationally orbiting. And so you can do a sort of dynamical measurement, which is similar. And basically, you find the same thing. In fact, I didn't tell you the, sorry, I kind of skipped a point. I skipped a point. So the velocity here is larger than can be predicted from the gas and the stars. Therefore, what we think is that there's mass that's here, but missing. We're not seeing it because it's not shining, because it doesn't um, shadow matter, light. We call it dark. It's basically not interacting with light. Otherwise, we'd have seen it. It's kind of a very simple definition. It's mass that's not seen. And the amount of mass that's not seen, you can mathematically model, and that's the curve, the smooth curve that's drawn through these data points. It's about seven times as much matter in this as there is in the stars. Okay. Now we jump to a bigger scale, a cluster of galaxies. And from the dynamics, all these galaxies are sort of orbiting each other. And then you can figure out, well, how much mass would it take for them to be orbiting each other? And again, it's larger than what's seen in the, in the galaxies by another factor of about seven. In fact, for clusters of galaxies, there's even a more remarkable thing. Do you see these little blue smudges? That is an Einsteinian gravitational lens. What that is, is the overall mass of all these yellow guys, if they were a perfectly spherical arrangement, and then there were a distant galaxy behind it, and there is here, it's this blue guy, then you, the observer, would see a perfectly lensed ring because the light that was going to clear the galaxy is bent and, and, and from either side and converges on our eyes or our telescope. It's not a perfectly spherically symmetric system, and so one galaxy here shows up a whole bunch of different times, kind of in little arclets, uh, as blue. All those blue spots are the single, a single galaxy in the background. And you can mathematically reconstruct the mass in this set of things. And you see these points, those are the galaxies, but there's all this mass around the galaxies. And that's a completely different measurement than simply watching these guys sort of orbit each other and talk about how fast they're moving. And it gives the same answer. And in fact, there's two other ways that they can, you can estimate the temperature of, the, of, of clusters, and they, you, all, four, all four say the same answer. So this is really remarkable. Now we're finding that seven times the mass of stars and gas that we can see in these big gravitational objects it's just simply not there in terms of like emitting light. And it's all the more remarkable because on the scale of the solar system down to the scale of a fraction of a millimeter, which is a huge range of scales, everything worked perfectly. 
Now, there is a class of thinking which says, well, wait a minute, it's not that there's some missing new matter there, it's that the gravity is somehow different on the very large scales and the very small scales. And that's, that's maybe the subject for another talk, but put it, suffice to say it's very difficult math, sort of theoretically to construct a model that does that. And so it's not proven, but the kind of the preponderance of evidence combined with sort of our understanding of how the theories probably should work says that there's, it's, 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 it's almost certainly a dark matter, or more, very likely to be dark matter. So there's, we're, we're looking for a new form of matter. Um, let's go to a bigger scale still and see if the same story holds. And when you go to a bigger scale still, you don't really see things moving. Instead, what people do is they take, with modern big telescopes, and this is an image that was coming out just when I was entering grad school, um, you kind of just survey where the galaxies are. They don't, they're not really moving much on big scales. Each dot is a galaxy. And this is one of the first so-called large-scale surveys of the universe. And rather than the universe on this very large scale, this is really very quite large. Um, so this is distance out, and you're just kind of looking in the sky. And this thing here people call the stick man. Um, it's not very uniform. It's kind of interesting, maybe a little bit like a very open Swiss cheese. Um, cut to uh, the, the beautiful work, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which came out in the 2000s. Many, many, many galaxies on a much larger scale. And there's this kind of interesting structure. Larger than this scale, the structure just sort of repeats, but there's just this kind of characteristic behavior. And uh, this doesn't apparently have anything to do with what I was talking about before, but, but bear with me, it does, okay? There is dark matter in this story, and I'm gonna tell you how, but I gotta just, I gotta talk a little bit first, okay? I just have to. So, okay, so I went to bigger scales and I discover that the universe kinda looks like Swiss cheese. Okay, well, so what? Well, what about the biggest possible scale? Well, the biggest possible scale is the measurement of the glow that is left over from the Big Bang. Um, the so-called cosmic microwave background, so, this was predicted shortly after people realized that there probably was this thing called the Big Bang. The universe used to be hot and dense, blah, blah, blah. One of the facts about that, if the universe used to be really hot and dense and there was an explosion and then it cooled and expanded, was that there should be a glow of light, really just the light that you would have in a candle flame. And then at some point, the, 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 the plasma cooled sufficiently that the flame went out. It no longer became a plasma. It simply cooled enough that electrons and protons combined to neutral hydrogen. The universe became transparent, and the light just free-streamed. And what does it look like? Well, it looks really boring. In all directions, this is the whole sky in astronomers' galactic coordinate, uh, astronomers coordinates. It's just a simple temperature. Um, it was, a, it was, it was a, a, a very ultraviolet flame temperature when it was born. 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and now 13.4 billion years later, it's cooled to be, and it's been redshifted out to be a sort of a, a, a microwave, you know, gigahertz frequency radio type signal. In the old days, if you turn on your TV set and you didn't have a channel, my brother and I, when we'd get up in the Saturday morning, wanted to watch cartoons pre-internet, and they didn't come on until 6, but you were so excited you got up at 5.30. We'd look at the TV, we used to call it swimming pool. It would just sit there and it was... Turns out about 2% of that was this radiation. <laughs> Photons that had last interacted with anything for 13 billion years ago, and then they provided entertainment for us on our Saturday morning, okay? So, uh, there's lots and lots and lots to say about this. A huge amount of cosmology has come out from studying the microwave background, and that's the subject of many talks. I want to focus on one aspect of it. Okay, namely, what it is, what's interesting, one, one thing about it is that it's uniform in all directions. There's this glow, it's in the radio, and it's, it's in all directions, but it's really not if we zoom in. And this is a famous plot you may have seen. If you've been anywhere near physics, you've probably seen it. And usually the microwave background is first shown that way. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of ripples, or um, uh, the, the red spots are where, where it was denser and hotter, and the blue spots are where it was less dense. So the plasma was uniform, but not quite. These ripples are about a part in 100,000. 
So essentially, it was one temperature, it was one density, but not quite. There was this ripples. This is from a satellite that recently flew called Planck. Um, okay. Bear with me. We're going to get back to dark matter. So the question is, on big scales, the universe looks like Swiss cheese, but on bigger scales, the universe is just simply uniform, early, 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 with a little bit of ripples. How did I go from something that was almost completely uniform to something where on the scale of galaxy, many, many galaxies, it kind of looks like Swiss cheese locally, it's kind of like stuff and nothing, right? I mean, it's nothing like the same to a part in 100,000, right? How did you go from here to here? And it turns out we really now, we actually think we have an understanding. There has emerged a standard model of cosmology that basically explains how we got from here to here within the Big Bang. And the ingredients are mostly gravity and the stuff that was in the Big Bang. So this is, um, I'm going to show a movie, and I'll talk about it, it's going to loop. It starts with an almost uniform plasma, and then the plasma just starts to do what gravity does. The places that were a little more dense um, gravitationally attracted matter from around them, and the places that were a little less dense lost. And uh, this, is, this is kind of the universe in a box. This needs high scale, you couldn't have done this 40 years ago, 30 years ago. You need high scale computing because the, the gravitational, um, this is even just not even, you don't even need general relativity. This is mostly normal, rel normal gravity. But the equations are very nonlinear. It's very, very difficult to calculate. It takes enormous computational power and tricks to do this. Um, but, but you can do it. And remarkably, what emerges are these kind of Swiss cheesy like structures exactly like, um, like the universe actually looks. So it's remarkable. We actually kind of have a theory. We understand how the universe grew uh, to what it looks like today. These are actually, this is on a large scale. You can side, sort of see that it kind of collapses to these sort of wall-like things with strong filaments. And then places where there's a lot of density, and those are going to become gravity, gravity um, sorry, galaxy clusters. Galaxies are kind of small on this scale. Here's the punchline. In this simulation, which pretty darn well matches, what people do is they take the statistics of this. How Swiss cheesy is it? How much cheese, how much air? And they compare it to the data. And this is, um, oh, sorry, and this is work that was done here at Slack. I should give attribution. There's, I have colleagues here that are you know, specialists in this. And um, this, is a, this is a particular simulation and all sorts of input parameters, how much of the various types of matter that are in the universe were put in, blah, 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 blah. This matches the data. The punchline is that this simulation only has dark matter in it. The normal matter, protons, electrons, all elements made of protons, electrons, and neutrons are irrelevant. They don't do this. Um, they were continuing to be a plasma longer than the dark matter was, and the dark matter started to grow density first, started to collapse first. If that ran over your head, forget it. It's, it's all right. The point is, the normal matter just doesn't do the trick. It takes dark matter, and the, and the normal matter just goes along for the ride. The dark matter starts, is more powerful at growing, at growing these structures. If there were no dark matter, the universe today would not be a completely uniform plasma to a part in 10 to the fifth, but it would be a uniform plasma to a part to 1%. One, 1%. It would just be this sea of protons with 1% variations, and probably the densest place, places would have accumulated and grown stars and such. But you wouldn't see anything like what we have today if there were no dark matter. Remarkable fact. Okay. So dark matter, the other thing is that in this simulation, for a long time people thought, oh, the dark matter, okay, so it's not, we don't see it as stars. Well, it's a bunch of planets. It's a bunch of hidden planets. And then there were theories of planetary formation. They said, no. People said, well, we don't really know how planets form, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe it's a bunch of black holes that, you know, collapse stars. All that's out the window with this sort of story because 
we're probing the earliest times in the, in the Big Bang, and, and there has to be dark matter, and it can't be the normal type of matter. It's a new kind of stuff. Well, you know, Slack is an accelerator, particle accelerator lab, and the uh, standard model of particle physics in large part was sort of understood here by creating all sorts of weird particles that live a short time when you collide at high energy, in, in, our, in Slack's case, electrons and positrons. We know that there's all sorts of strange particles that can be created and mostly go away. The Big Bang created all sorts of particles. Maybe the dark matter is a fundamental particle, not like, you know, somehow football-sized things, but just a new type of particle that was created in the Big Bang. In fact, it's very natural to think that because it's just the fact is that, the, that, the, that, 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 that nature is such that there are sort of all sorts of unusual particles, most of which are short-lived, one of which, the neutrino, which is very unusual, is long-lived. There's neutrinos everywhere in the universe. We hardly ever see them or know about them, but they're real. And they don't quite fit the bill to be the dark matter, but they're almost, they almost could. So it's natural to think that the dark matter was probably some particle from the Big Bang. Well, in fact, it's almost tautological. All of the stuff in the universe came from the Big Bang. So, but we should look to what we understand about the Big Bang to try to figure out what it was. Maybe that's a better statement. Okay, so let's think about the Big Bang. So the Big Bang was a hot, dense plasma. And if it wasn't hot enough and dense enough for you, go back another few seconds. And it was hotter and denser, et cetera. Up to unimaginable densities and energies where there must have been physics we don't know about. But even ignoring that sort of exotica, at some reasonable energy, what was interesting about the Big Bang is it was a matter-antimatter plasma. Okay, so this is a Feynman diagram which is fun. You get to say Feynman diagram. Um, here's an electron. Okay, that's normal. And here's an anti-electron. An electron but positively charged. These things really exist. If an electron and an anti-electron find each other, they annihilate, as Spock used to say, into pure energy. Well, not quite. Into another particle. And then that can give birth to a, some exotic particle, which I'll label chi, and its anti-partner, which I'll label chi bar. These might be the dark matter. In the early universe, for any type of particle like that that can be created, you'll just have a soup of all this stuff with almost like a chemical reaction going in both directions, just, just going along. This is a Higgs, anti-Higgs, or a W, anti-W, particles that were studied you know, study here at SLAC, et cetera. Proton, anti-proton. In fact, the, the, the early universe was just a teeming sea of matter, antimatter, with reactions going in both directions. Now, the universe isn't like that today. What happened? Well, okay, so suppose this is some heavy, interesting particle that maybe is the dark matter, or, or maybe I'll just put proton, antiproton over here. When the universe cools off a lot enough, and everything is lower at energy, you can no longer spontaneously create matter, antimatter through, this, through the reaction that goes to the right, say. If these things weigh more than those things, and these things aren't very energetic, you can't give birth to that. You need an energy um, bigger than Einstein's, oh, that's my second equation, I'm sorry, I lied. Um, you need an energy bigger than Einstein's famous mc squared in order just to give birth to a particle out of energy. And so when the energy of everything is less than the mass of these guys, this rea the forward reaction turns off and in a chemical reaction sense, the back reaction keeps proceeding, these guys, annihilate, it's this wonderful phys term physicists use, when matter, matter and antimatter uh, meet, physicists don't say that they collide, we say that they annihilate, because they're just, it's just gone, okay? So the matter and antimatter have annihilated away, so today there is no sea of Higgs anti-Higgs, there's no sea of proton anti-proton. In fact, if you're thinking, if you're if you, hard enough, you'd realize, wait a minute, well, how is there anything today it's because there was an imbalance of matter over antimatter at a part in 10 to the 11. But early on, it was just tons of matter, antimatter. Okay. Um, now, there is one loophole. So the question is, well, okay, okay, that just tells me that all the weird stuff that we created accelerators is gone.
But is there a loophole? Could I have some stuff left over that could be the dark matter? And there's one way. There's probably several ways, but there's one really natural way. It's called freeze out. Things are cooling down so that the forward reaction is going to stop, the backward reaction is going to continue, but also the density of everything is dropping. The plasma is expanding. The universe was expanding very, very rapidly. What if the particle and its antiparticle never find each other when it's time for them to die, to annihilate? Maybe they just don't find each other and they're left over. We call that freezing out. Okay? This was all abstract. Let me do it in cartoons. Let's go to Saturday morning. Okay, here's my plasma. Let's call that an electron and that an anti-electron. Let's call this the chi, the dark matter, anti-dark matter, or this could be proton, anti-proton. And this is just a teeming C and the arrows are saying it's a lot of energy. Okay. Um, and then things cool down. Now it's time for uh, uh, this to find one of these. Is it randomly going to happen? If they do, they'll annihilate, they're gone, okay. But the universe is, um, can I offer that? No. But the universe's density is dropping, and now maybe this is not so likely to find that, okay? Um, alternatively, what if the yellow guys are really small? They be, maybe they don't collide. So then there's this idea, three ideas. First idea, how many particles might be left over after this freeze-out process depends on how big they are, right? If they're little, the, the particle and antiparticle may not find each other. It, in addition to the fact the universe Okay? And you can plug in numbers to this argument. We can ask the question, okay, is there a particle that was small enough that would be left over from this freeze-out argument, and would it be the dark matter? And it turns out, yes, it would kind of have to be a heavy particle about the size of an, a mass of an atom, but remarkably, it would have to be about the size of all things neutrinos, which were a known particle. I really can't oversell this simple sen sentence. The argument was very general. The question was, take this picture, sorry, take this picture, pick the size of, yellow, of the yellow guys such that they froze out and the right number is left over to be dark matter. What is that size? It could have been the size of an elephant numerically. It could have been the size of a planet numerically, which wouldn't make any sense for a particle. It could have been a Google smaller than the size of an atom. But it wasn't. It's the size of a particle that's known in the standard model, a particle we know that has a weak interaction. Oops, I went the wrong way. The neutrino. So this fact, it's a numerical fact. Is it a coincidence? Is it a hint? Is it a profound connection? basically has consumed my career, and not just my career, a bunch of people my age. <laughs> We've all got caught up in this. It's a mass delusion, but <laughs> anyway. In fact, nowadays, people younger than me call this the wimp miracle. But okay, I, I think you can't call it a miracle until we find out if it's true or not. All right. Let's, okay, so now I introduced the idea of um, all, all these exotic particles and particle physics. This is the most fundamental little diagram of the models, particles in the, part, in the standard model. I don't know if you've seen this. This is analogous to doing the, um, you know, the uh, a periodic table, if you will. These two quarks form protons and neutrons. These are the exotic ones that live a short time. Here's the electron and the, anti, and the electron's neutrino. Um, this is a heavier partner of the electron called a muon that lives about a microsecond. These are particles involved in the forces. This is the Higgs. Um, it's not enough just to say, oh, it's an, I don't want to just say it's a new particle. I want to kind of relate a new particle like a neutrino to the standard ones. Effectively, um, this, this animal here, that would be the beautiful dark matter. It's about the size of a neutrino, if you will, it's got the weak scale force, but it's very heavy, about 100 proton, uh, 80 proton masses. 
Unfortunately, it lives only a very short time. I need something like the neutrino, but heavy like that, but that's stable. The neutrino's stable. And, um, okay, that's what I'd like to think about. So now let me shift gears a little bit and talk about if that's what we think maybe the dark matter is, I just, let's, let's expand on it a bit. And I want to I wanna think a bit about the size of particles. I said it's particles the size of a neutrino. Well, what do we mean by the size of a particle? You know, quantum mechanics and field theory in a way, modern, you know, our modern understanding of particle physics has a lot of weird things. One of the weird things is that our understanding of particles is that they're point-like, meaning if they have some structure, it's actually like, you know, as best we can tell, it's some arbitrarily compact size. And then there's a field around each one. And there's several different fields, and those are the carriers of the forces. So electromagnetism has a force field which is about the size of an atom. It basically is the thing that fills space in your body. Your atoms are packed together about uh, electric force fields distance apart. That's a moderate strength. So here's an, electro, here's an electric force field. Then there's something that works in the nucleus, the strong force field. It's much smaller. This is 10 to the minus 10 meters, already a freakishly small size. But the strong force, not to scale here, is five orders of magnitude, 100,000 times smaller. It's very intense, but very short ranged. Then there's the weak force, which is I've mentioned it's this thing that's not very familiar at all, but we know about it in particle physics. We've proven it in accelerators. It's another five orders of magnitude or so smaller. And it's about the strength of the electric force, but very short in range. Then there's gravity, which is really, really weak, but it's got this huge extent. And the modern view of a particle is it's this point-like thing at the center, which is sort of imponderable, surrounded by a force field. Okay. Another question is, how do we know anything about any of this? Well, we collide particles. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I give you a proton and, you know, it's in your hand, you can't deal with it or see it or anything, right? We learned about particles initially when they're, initially from cosmic rays, where particles are born at high energy and weird exotic things in space and they come crashing down. And then we studied them in accelerators where we accelerate them to high energy. So we've studied particles by colliding them. And all of these aspects I just mentioned kind of come out in these collisions. So let's study it. Let's talk about this a second. So here is a proton in my view. It's got a blue force field. It also has a strong force field. And it also has a weak force field. And I'm supposed to imagine that the range scale between those three fields is actually five orders of magnitude different, 100,000 between each. And then somehow there's some mass at the center. And now here's a neutron. A neutron is similar, but doesn't have that electric charge. And if I fire a neutron at a proton, it goes right by. It certainly doesn't care about this blue field. It just goes right through. This is the statement you sometimes see, which I think is really kind of fun to say, but actually kind of silly, which is that, oh, matter is mostly empty space with these you know, point-like things. No, bull, there's, everything is filled with electric force field. That's why, you know, we're made of stuff. But from the point of view of the strong force, if I'm a neutron, no, then it's maybe true. The question is, is matter empty space or not, depends on what sort of force fields you're carrying around with you. Okay, now if I do send a neutron and it happens to hit the proton dead on, so the strong forces interact, then you scatter. And we measure that, so a particle detector would have measured, uh, would have measured, um, oh, sorry, I had to do my animation again. A particle detector could notice that normally a, pro a neutron went past a proton, but occasionally scattered, and you could kind of figure out the range of that force. If I think of a particle like a neutrino, well, the neutrino, which is tiny, 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 has no strong force, and I fire it, it's incredibly unlikely to scatter off because I'd have to have some you know, sort of dead-on collision from this very small size. Okay. So I wanted to get two ideas across here. It's the force which gives you a size, and we learned about this by colliding things at high energy. High energy compared to, say, like room temperature. And now a final thought. Size and mass aren't related. That's an interesting thought. Now, if you take a neutrino, well, okay, a neutrino is very, very small and very, very light. 
Neutrinos weigh a little bit, but they weigh about as much as a photon of light or less. The equivalent E equals mc squared. They're very light. But the other particles are kind of all over the map. This Z boson I mentioned is like a neutrino in size, but like the weight of a gold atom, roughly. Well, not a gold atom, I just like saying gold atom, but a heavy atom. Um, an electron is big in size, but fairly low in mass. Okay. I wanted to give you that context because now I want to present the idea what people hope or think may well be the dark matter, a weakly interacting massive particle. But I wanted to give you that context that we're not just kind of, you know, well, we're, we're framing it within what we've learned in particle physics. We're assigning this particle a weak force. It also has gravity. All particles have gravity, but not weaker, not charge or uh, strong. And we're picking a mass, actually, which more technically is related to electroweak symmetry breaking, um, is one way of looking at it. Also, just from cosmology, you kind of get a broad guidance. It can't be a light thing like a neutrino. So it's, um, it's kind of grounded within particle physics, but inspired by cosmology. And it's natural for that its mass would be like an atom. Okay, so now let's go look for it. Sorry, did I say WIMP was weakly interacting massive particle? Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, if I roll back to the third slide where we had the galaxy and we had that curve of how things rotated, the astronomers who study this tell us that or the astrophysicists who study it, astronomers and astrophysicists, tell us that when you have a galaxy, the gravitational dynamics are consistent with it being embedded in a big spherical object, which is called a halo, of whatever the unknown dark matter is. And here I just went to the web and I found a nice little cutaway cross-section where we cut you know, half of the halo away. And perversely, they've drawn the dark matter in white. Um, and what is the dark matter doing? Well, it's doing what everything in this picture is doing. It's just gravitationally orbiting. The, hey, the galaxy itself is, is just rotating, right? And um, in, in the halo, everything is kind of orbiting, nice, not nice circular orbits, which I kind of hinted here, but all sorts of random orbits. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the dark matter is actually, it is largely outside the main part, but it's, it's, it's right down there to the center. And you can tell that from detailed studies of the galaxies. And in fact, it's interesting. Um, if a wimp weighs about like a gold atom, then the density of them, measured just from this galactic dynamics, is such that there's about one in a liter or one in a Coke bottle. And they're, they're orbiting at a speed which is just about the speed that everything orbits in the galaxy, or at least at our distance from the center of the galaxy, which is about a thousandth the speed of light, or 300,000 meters a second. Yeah. Um, by the way, you know we're going that fast? That's how fast the, the Milky Way is. I mean, the, the solar system is orbiting with the plane of the galaxy. Yeah, yes. Okay. That's a non-negligible velocity. It's not as much, like, so, you know, this is like if, if the dark matter were an asteroid, you know, it's Armageddon time, right? It's moving with the real velocity such that as an individual particle, it has a lot of energy compared to room temperature. It will collide with things, rarely, if it's weakly interacting and is tiny, 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 but it will collide with things in a particle detector sense, and we can look for those collisions. And that's the big idea. Even if I don't know for sure that the dark matter is WIMPs, I do know how much there is locally and I do know how fast it is moving. And therefore, if it's a particle-like, I know what it's going to be like if it collides. And the answer is it dumps energy about equal to a low-energy X-ray. So I need an X-ray detector. I can go look for this stuff. Okay. So let's think about an abstract X-ray detector. Well, no, a WIMP detector. Okay, so here's the detector, and it's going to look for WIMPs. And the WIMPs are coming from outer space, but I just want to highlight the fact that, on average, the WIMPs don't give a darn about Earth. A weakly interacting particle like a neutrino or a WIMP, you know, you go to the dentist and you have an x-ray and they give you a little lead apron, it's a uh, sixteenth of an inch thick, and it stops all the x-rays. How much lead does it take to stop a neutrino? Anyone want to guess? A light year. It doesn't even stop it, it just gets it angry. It bounces off and goes in a different direction. Okay. 
Wimps would be the same. So the wimp could be coming from any direction. It's most likely went through the earth, but occasionally uh, those two numbers, the, the number of them and that velocity, that implies millions are going through your body every second. So if I have a detector sitting here, there's millions of wimps going through it every second. Every once in a great while, I'll have that dead-on collision and I'll see a little interaction. Okay? And it's at the lower end of the energy scale of the type of detectors that people make. Okay? Um, X-rays x -rays are three orders of mag... No, six orders of magnitude less energetic than the particles at the LHC, right? No, nine. Nine orders of magnitude. Okay? But, you know, we know how to build detectors that can see x-rays. Okay, it's not trivial. Um, there's all sorts of backgrounds. One thing is there's cosmic rays. I mentioned them earlier. Cosmic rays are particles coming from outer space, and they'll just go screaming through your detector. Well, okay, go underground. Cosmic rays can be stopped by dirt. Um, there's one in particular. Cosmic ray showers create muons, which I mentioned. Um, maybe famously you learned that muons live a long time when they're highly relativistic, and it's one of the early proofs of special relativity. They can go a long, long distance, even through rocks. So people now are going about a mile underground. Experiment I'm going to tell you about is a mile underground. But then finally, these all kind of go away, just about. Then there's another problem. There's radioactivity. Um, radioactive caves and the rock around the detector, they create various particles. You might think of radioactivity as this kind of miasma. Well, in detail, it's, you know, each radioactive decay um, creates, um, creates maybe a gamma particle or a beta. A gamma is a photon. We call it a gamma when it comes from radioactivity. Uh, beta, which is, well, in the early days, people named the things they measured alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We now know that's a photon, that's an electron, and that's a helium nucleus. But they have old-fashioned old names still are there. And these are just part, you know, part, particles that come out of radioactive decay. And they're crashing into the detector, okay, if you don't do anything. So a happy WIMP detector will be underground and it'll have a shield, okay? So that's the cartoon view. Well, this is not easy. Let's talk about radioactivity. Um, our host asked me to make this chart. And I had a great time making it. It's very interesting. So there was an X, the great XKCD, if you don't, go Google it if you don't know XKCD, cartoon about radioactivity. And half of what I was up here, I pulled off of that. So, um, so this is a relative rate of radioactivity in sieverts, which is some, well, actually, it's an interesting unit. It's a joule per kilogram. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's the unit on a microwave oven, right? I and mean, that's like a lot of energy. Okay. So, let me see, uh, an annual human dose is here. That's just what we are, you know, that's what you get from your environment. Uh, there's this thing that people have been, it's uh, an internet meme now, a banana equivalent dose. If you eat a banana, how, how much do you get a dose? And it's, now this is a large number of scales here, right? This is uh, between a, uh, the annual human dose and a banana is about th uh, three orders of magnitude, factor of a thousand or more. So if you, if you ate a banana, a third of a, three bananas a day, you double your dose. Okay. Um, now people, when they hear radioactivity, they think, oh, safety, danger, right? Danger, Will Robinson. Will Robinson. Um, the Fukushima accident uh, from the XKCD cartoon, it said two Fukushima workers. I think, presume those were the two most radiated fellows. They're about there. Fatal was up about another hundred. Of course, unfortunately, Chernobyl, a bunch of the people that went in did die. Ten-minute exposure at the Chernobyl core right after it happened was up here. So this is a pretty intense difference between here and here. This is the background we need to achieve in LZ. Uh, LZ is an experiment I'm going to tell you about. Okay? Let's look at some of these other things. So, a banana equivalent dose is one banana, but if you lived with a banana for three years, it's up here, okay? All of the backgrounds, the radioactive background, I'm going to tell you, that I'm going to tell you about how we reduce radioactive backgrounds. But after we do kind of our shielding, the backgrounds that we can't easily get rid of, like from just even ever hitting the detector, 
for the experiment I'm going to talk about are about here. They're about as they're further from the annual human dose than the annual human dose is from dying, okay, by a good little bit. Um, when you have natural radioactivity, one of, the, um, one of the parts, which is a little bit nasty for dark matter search, is neutrons. They're a very subdominant part of most backgrounds. So when you have this much normal background, the amount that's in neutrons is down here. And then way, way, way down here, Let's count it from, from annual human dose, 10 to the minus, say, 3, to 10 to the minus 15 orders of 100 trillion times lower um, is where we need to get. It's a haystack. It's a serious needle and haystack problem. Okay. So we saw the cartoon, now I'm going to show you kind of like real drawings and diagrams of what we did to kind of do that. So first, the underground part. Um, we're at something called the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Um, that is a head frame for a gold mine which shut down in 2002. Um, it's actually kind of an interesting story. It's a big sprawling mine. Actually, this is a little bit of it. Most of it's way down over here. It went down to 8,000 feet. This is at 4,850 feet. It's in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's the Homestake Mine. It's where Hearst Sr. made his fortune. If you've seen the movie Deadwood, TV show Deadwood, it was about this gold. And Deadwood is right next to this. Um, okay. Uh, that's a photo of the, in the, in the winter. And that's this, this it's called a head frame. There's a, um, that's this old building with this 1930s machinery with this huge wheel and a guy in a kind of a, Wizard of Oz type contraption pulling levers to, to run the thing and the, it drops what's called a lift, which norm, normal people call an elevator, down 5,000 feet. Um, it's kind of a fun place to do an experiment. Um, nearby is the um, town of Sturgis, <laughs> which, so the population of the state of South Dakota is about 760,000 people and uh, for about a week in August, well, you, if you ask people, they won't tell you the number of people that come to the motorcycle rally. They'll tell you the number of motorcycles that came to the motorcycle rally for some reason. And essentially, they're, they double the population of the state. About 800,000 motorcycles show up and, and roar around. It's about 20 miles from the lab. Anyway, so here's, here's, the, here's the detector. So there it is. It's underground. And... I'll talk about the inside of the detector and how the detector works in a moment, but now I'm looking at the outside, and uh, here's a grad student um, who actually now works at Slack. Um, uh, and this is inside of a tank of water. Well, the water's not there yet. This is right before we put the water in. And the water is the shield to get rid of radioactivity to a large extent. So the rock outside makes a lot of radioactivity. Actually, lead is a really good shielding agent, but lead is very expensive and water is very cheap. And it's actually, it's actually really interesting. It's very easy to purify water to get rid of radioactivity um, uh, just because people have invested a lot in low-cost ways to purify water. Um, water is a solvent. It dissolves minerals. And most radioactivity is mineral-like. Uh, mineral, uranium, thorium, and potassium are the three primary elements that are radioactive, and they're all kind of minerals and dissolve in water. Yet it's very easy to get very low radioactivity water just because people know how to cheaply purify water. So we made a tank of water. It's, a, it's an eight-meter diameter tank, so we have about three meters of water, and that essentially stops all radioactivity. We create an environment where the only radioactivity we care about is in the materials that are now in the detector, what we kind of brought with us. I'm running a little long. Should I keep going? Is it all right if I keep going? All right. So it's an interesting story, like how do I get low, low to radioactivity materials? And there's a whole host of stories I can talk about. Let me just talk about metals. This is a titanium vessel. So titanium turns out to be really low in radioactivity. Um, your first thought if you're going to build a vessel like that is stainless steel. Yeah, stainless steel isn't so good, partly because of metallurgy, but partly because, and this is nuts, when people make stainless steel, they have a vat and they have molten stainless steel in the vat. And they want to know, how is my vat wall melted? And in the old days, what they used to do is they would put pellets of cobalt-60, a highly radioactive element, 
in the wall of the vat, and they would monitor the radioactivity in the molten part with a Geiger counter. And whenever it went up a step, it meant they melted another pellet of cobalt into the mat, vat, and the wall was getting thinner. And if that sounds crazy, but it's true. I mean, and, we, and, and because steel is so heavily recycled, even though that's not so much used, it's a crapshoot trying to buy low radioactivity steel. So we, all, we don't. Um, then for some reason, copper is really low in radioactivity. Something about electroforming copper, um, a lot of metals are electroformed, but for copper, the chemistry of copper is sufficiently different than uranium, thorium, and potassium that those are just sort of removed. And it turns out it's not true of most metals. But copper is a cruddy metal to build, work with. It's really soft and icky. So we investigated titanium. There was a rumor from a Russian experiment that, oh, titanium is good. And it took us about two or three years to figure out. And titanium actually is incredibly chemically reactive, and it starts as sand. And sand is really radioactive. In fact, there's beaches of titanium dioxide sand. But they're really radioactive because they just incorporate a lot of ugly stuff. But Turns out titanium is so reactive that we win. It is so reactive, it's an abundant substance. The reason titanium is exotic and is expensive is that it's so reactive that in order to make metal from titanium, they react it with chlorine first and form a titanium tetrachloride gas, and they distill it. And it's like, aha, whenever you distill something, you can get it really pure. And the industry, for reasons that have nothing to do with radioactivity, the first thing they do with titanium is they turn it into a gas and distill it. And so um, for LZ, we have a five-ton slab of incredibly radioactively clean titanium. And it's a big, like, kind of coup um, for us. We were really happy that we kind of figured that out. We thought that was really cool. That's the sort of thing that gets us up in the morning, actually. <laughs> Figuring out a new metal that's low in radioactivity. And there's like a hundred stories. This is a 40-year-old field of low background experiments. And so there's all this kind of, you know, arcane knowledge in our heads about why a piece of ceramics radioactive and a piece of Teflon is not. Okay, um, that's a view from the outside that water tank and the underground facility. Um, here we are and we're 4,850 feet below the surface in, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's actually about sea level there. This is what the detector looks like. So we've gotten rid of a lot of the radioactivity. From the outside it's gone. We're building the detector as much as possible out of low radioactivity materials, but you still have a problem. Titanium is still somewhat radioactive. There's um, all sorts of stuff on the perimeter that's radioactive, and so the design of this detector helps enormously to deal with it. And let me explain why. So here's the incoming particle, and it collides somewhere in the middle of this. And I haven't told you what the middle is made out of. Um, it collides and goes out, and then that collision, it's a, you know, the, the, the WIMP, it, it deposits energy. When I say deposits energy, what you mean is, you know, what, what happens when like a radioactive particle hits your body? It, it, it smacks an atom and knocks an electron off, maybe at high energy, and that electron courses through the material and knocks a bunch of electrons off of atoms and leaves lots of bunch of, basically leaves a bunch of atoms upset. By upset, I mean they're in a high energy state. And they might relax by emitting light, which is mostly kind of reabsorbed. In certain materials, the electrons which are ripped off of atoms in that process, the so-called ionization, and any light that's generated from the excited atoms is, is, is measurable, one or the other or both. The noble elements, beautifully, you can measure both the electrons that are knocked off of atoms and they, they nicely make light that you can measure. And so this detector is filled with a liquid, a, a noble element, and we want a lot of it so rather than be gas, we want it to be liquid. And it turns out, to be more sensitive to the WIMPs, you want it to be heavier. So your noble elements are helium, right? They're all familiar to everybody. Helium, neon, famous of the lamps. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, famous from Superman. And um, xenon. And then radon, which is really radioactive. You don't make a detector out of that. And um, so... This is a, this, the middle here, it's filled with liquefied xenon. Xenon is a nice heavy liquid, aluminum floats in it. Because of that, it, if, if, if there's radioactivity around the peri peri periphery, it doesn't get very far. And that's an important part of the story. Okay, so it's filled with liquefied xenon. The particle came in, it smacked it. This could have been radioactivity, but hopefully it was a wimp. 
Um, there's a flash of light. The light goes and propagates around, and there's, you see these circles? Those are um, single photon sensitive photo detectors. It's an old fashioned technology called the photomultiplier tube. It sort of works like an old fashioned, like a cathedral TV set in reverse, uh, time reversed. Um, uh, but in any case, just for our purposes, just know that it's a light sensor, and it sees single photons. And we have a whole array of them above, an array of them below, and the walls are reflective. Secondly, um, there's kind of a discolor, there's this, 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 this shaded color here. What it is re representing is that there's an electrostatic, there's an electric grid. It's a kind of a stretched mesh that's porous. And there's a set of them up here, and they set up a big electric field. There's about a, it's a big voltage down here, like 50 kilovolts. And electrons, which are knocked off of atoms, are moved, drifted, as we say, up to the top of the liquid. And there's this kind of weird thing. Um, this liquid surface is here, and we pull the electrons out of the liquid, and in a high electric field region, in a small gap with a high electric field just above the liquid, we induce the electrons to excite the gaseous xenon, because there's gases in them above the liquid xenon, and you get a second flash of light, okay? That was a whole mouthful. First flash of light where the event was, electrons pulled away by an electric field, pulled out of the liquid, forced to make a second flash of light sometime later. And this process beautifully tells us exactly where the event was, as follows. There's the first flash of light and the time later until the second flash of light that's measured from the electrons. That time difference and the known drift speed of the electrons gives us the depth. And then you can see the second flash of light, which happens right underneath this array. You can kind of do positioning just from the pattern of light in that top array. The red is kind of, you know, you look where it's reddest and point down. And of course, you do some averaging technique. You can actually do very well. About a tenth the diameter of one of these photo tubes. You can kind of tell where this is. And so in a big tank of liquid, without, with nothing in the center, we can measure where events are in the center. And all this radioactivity is coming in from the outside. And xenon stops gamma rays. Xenon stops betas dead. Xenon stops neutrons not very well, but it does. And the center of the detector is very, very immune to radioactivity. So I think I pointed out that the total amount of radioactivity striking the detector is big. And we needed to go another about six or seven, or, no, it was about eight orders of magnitude down to this rate. A lot of that comes from all the radioactivity just ranges out around the outside. Um, in, in Lux detector, this thing was half a meter on a side. You could kind of hug it. The next detector, LZ, is one and a half meters on a side. You can't hug it. So these, but these are big. Okay, so now let's look at um, the data. Um, this first flash of light, this is actual data. Um, this is time, and this is, uh, this is just kind of a silly thing. I just count up, the, this is just which PMT just numbered, these guys got numbered one through 100, and I just put the number there. So this is just different PMTs. The first flash of light was measured by two PMTs. That's kind of what a, the pulse looks like. This is, um, it's about 10 nanoseconds wide. Then uh, sometime later, there's the second flash, and that's the pattern, and that told us, and that's the, the charge. So it's just kind of fun to see. And then we spend, you know, oodles of uh, hours, you know, weeks, days, pouring over this data. Um, now, sorry, I need to explain what I'm doing here. So now let's look in detail at the, at the, at the, at the event site. Um, if you have a background gamma ray particle, Gamma rays are photons. That's one of the main backgrounds. And they strike some location in the detector. They knock an electron out of the atom. I've told you about that. And the electron goes bu buzzing around and slows down and stops. And the little blue dots are like every place that might have created a second low energy electron, the one we collect and measure, or a, a little bit of scintillation light. This is a tiny space. This is a 1% the width of a human hair is kind of contains that event. Now, why did I put this complicated drawing up? Most radioactivity looks like that. The WIMPs, which will strike a nucleus, look different. This is characteristic of when an electron is struck, and most backgrounds hit an electron on an atom. If you strike instead the nucleus of an atom, which is what WIMPs do, let's zoom in on a little space this big and blow it up. 
now I'm talking about a size that's about 100 atoms in scale. And I get a similar looking structure. It's a little different in detail. It's more sharp with branches. This is the type of track, we call it a track, of damage caused by a wimp striking uh, the nucleus of an atom. And if we had a microscope and could look here and could look here, then that would be the final handle on getting rid of radioactivity. We would have ranged a bunch of radioactivity out because it doesn't get into the center of the xenon volume. And then we would have looked at our events one by one and we would have said that's dark matter and that's not dark matter. Um, we can't do that, but we can do something else. If we divide the electron, amount of, the number of electrons measured by the amount of light measured, for the, gamma, for, the, for the backgrounds I was just describing, gamma rays, so on this axis, and this is energy going over to the right, all of the backgrounds appear in this band of data between these two blue lines. Down here is what the signal from WIMPs would look like. You say, well, how do I know what the signal would WIMPs would look like? You know, this is background I, can, I know about. In fact, uh, tritium gives you a similar background. We dissolve tritium in our detector to measure this. We dissolved it in and took it back out. Um, this background actually, this sort of, the, sorry, this signal, which is a little different, also comes from neutrons. But neutrons are a much rarer background, if you remember that. I said that in an earlier slide. And this set of a data between this red band is, um, the, the scales are the same. This red band here, the center of it is that red line, or this, this blue band up here, the center of it is this blue line. It's a kind of a subtle difference. We wish it was a bigger difference, but this is the detector. That we go to war with the detector we've got. And the detector we've got does see a difference between an, a, a something striking a nucleus, which a neutron does. It was in my movie, right? Um, versus something striking an electron, which is what 99.99% of our backgrounds do, okay? So our data. Our data is this, the same scale changed a little bit, but the idea is exactly the same. We saw a bunch of stuff that looked, was in between the blue bands. We look for stuff in between the red bands. There's some amount spilling over from the blue, but what we really want to look is down here, because that was free from contamination, unless there's wimps. Sadly, <laughs> there were no wimps. Not in Lux. This is the best world. This is the last few slides were kind of heavy, I know. Um, but I'm showing you the raw data from the world's best dark matter search experiment. And it's the absence of anything down in the lower, in the lower part of this band, which is, okay. You could say, well, how do I know there wouldn't be, if I started to see dark something that I would know it wouldn't be neutrons? Neutrons, if they come into the detector, 99 times out of 100, they'll bounce around several times before they leave. So what we can do is look for multiply scattering events versus an event that just went, versus just a single ping in the detector. And if there's a lot of neutrons, we'll know they're there. They could be a nuisance, but we'll know they're there. And there weren't there. So there weren't neutron backgrounds. And we kind of predicted that from our radioactivity screening, blah, blah, blah. And um, okay, so that was the Lux experiment. Okay, so soldier on, soldier on. I've been at this most of my career. So let's keep going. A much bigger detector looks a lot like the last one. We're in the middle of building it. I'll just say one thing we did. We've surrounded it by a different type of detector which has a material which just gives you scintillation light. So we've completely surrounded the detector by a scintillator. And any radioactive thing that goes off in here, gamma rays, uh, they go bouncing around too. Neutrons go bouncing around like mad. We're worried about a neutron coming in, bouncing once, bouncing and getting out, which could happen in Lux. And in this new experiment called Lux Zeppelin, uh, the Lux group joined with a British group called Zeppelin. We formed a super group called LZ. And we ripped off the, uh, no, a, a guerrilla artist in South Dakota made this little logo. Um, uh, if a neutron goes in and comes out, then it'll, it'll bounce. That's unlikely, but can happen, and then it will bounce around in this liquid scintillator tank, and we'll, and we'll tag it. So this gives us another factor of 100 reduction of backgrounds and neutrons. Anyway, so those are the sorts of games we play. 
Um, it's difficult building these experiments. There's many aspects of them which are challenging. We have a lab here at Slack which we're using to prototype some of the parts that are in the, um, uh, in the experiment. Uh, this is a prototype of the, uh, the detector guts. Um, and some of the students and postdocs that uh, work with us are over here in the audience. You want to raise your hand? And um, they should take a bow. I'm up here talking and talking, and these guys are slaving away in the lab and making the thing work. Um, uh, uh, and here's a, a, another system, and I've run out of time to talk about it, but we, we remove traces amount, trace amounts of krypton from xenon, and you can ponder, how would you do that, since they're both inert and noble? And I'm going to wrap up now with a final slide, or so, two, two more slides. So this is sort of um, kind of a story of the dark matter game. Uh, it's a little bit of a technical plot, but let me just talk it through. We don't really know. I said that from the um, freeze-out story, we think the dark matter would be a weak, a, a particle that's the size of the neutrino. But this kind of story about how big the force fields are, it takes two to tangle. It's a kind of a combined force field of the nucleus that's struck and this new exotic particle, which has something like the weak force of particle physics. There's some uncertainty as to exactly how big, effectively, the particle is. We don't really know, and there's actually you know, a good amount of uncertainty. So this is the WIMP size, or in fact, we call it the cross-section. More or less just the area of it, the effective area of it. Look here, this, these are some physicist units, but these are some sort of, well, crazy numbers, but normal units, centimeters squared. And we're talking 10 to the minus 40 numbers. Very small. Okay. So we don't know the vertical, we don't know the horizontal, that's how heavy it is. I kept saying it's about like a gold atom, what's a gold atom is 107, whatever it is. Uh, that's 100 proton masses, that's a 1,000 proton masses, that's 10 proton masses. So that's right in the range of, you know, the normal elements. Okay, in 1999 an experiment was done that fielded a small experiment, in fact that was one that I was part of, my graduate experiment. A small experiment, we didn't see anything, just like we didn't see anything in Lux. Having not seen anything, we can say, oh, the particles are smaller than a certain size, otherwise they would have collided more often in the detector. So we draw a line like this, and we say everything above that is excluded. If the particles are really light, there's not, there's, um, they don't deposit much energy and you can't see it. So all of these curves go up, you're sort of unable to see low, 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 low masses. On this side, the curve goes up slowly because if I go from them weighing 100 proton masses to 1,000 proton masses, there's 10 times fewer of them because the density of them is the number we get from astronomy. So this is just a simple factor of 10 on this incredibly crazy fast scale over here, between here and here, okay? That explains this curve. And since then, Lux was here and then here, sorry, two curves. We just came out with data that's down about here. What are these dots? Well, these dots are things that theorists tell us, ah, that's where it is. Um, our host, Michael, uh, he was hoping it was going to be right there. Um, well, we were all hoping it was going to be there somewhere. Um, these are models inspired by supersymmetry, which is one of the ideas that, you know, that was what one of the things people are looking for at the LHC. Um, that could be a whole talk in and of itself. So far, we haven't seen anything, and we're here. LZ is going to get way down here. And a last thought, for better or worse, for this way of looking for dark matter, there's an end to the story. It turns out, I've talked about neutrinos a number of times, there's a number of sources in, in, the, astro, in the cosmos of neutrinos. One is the sun. There's a bunch of neutrinos, 100 billion going through your body every second from the sun. There's a bunch of neutrinos from cosmic rays. Those will strike nuclei and make a signal that is sort of indistinguishable from WIMPs. They'll strike a nucleus just like a WIMP does. And they have an energy spectrum which looks pretty much, that means how many versus energy, that looks pretty much like a WIMP. And that's called the neutrino floor here. Out here it's from cosmic rays and down here it's from, from the sun. And we don't really think we can dig into it very far. And LZ is going to kind of come with a, within kissing distance of this. In fact, that's a three-year run. If LZ ran for 10 years, it's going to get another factor of a, several closer. So we're all really hoping that the dark matter shows up in this next little bit. 
On the other hand, we can't keep doing this forever. Um, one depressing outcome is that, in fact, dark matter is this type of thing, and it's down here, and we can't see it this way. There's a few other ways to kind of try to see it, but they're all hard. Or maybe the dark matter is something else, okay? Let me conclude with another, just a figure, a photo. Um, you know, I already had our students and postdocs take a bow. It's great that I'm up here giving this talk, but there's, you know, this is a collaborative endeavor. It takes a lot of people to build an experiment like this. Um, and sometimes you have collaborators from places like Coimbra, Portugal, where this photo was, where they have an old library. And we have meetings, and this is a meeting. And so this is the set of folks. Most of the folks there are busily uh, constructing the LZ experiment, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop at that point. So, um, I'm sorry, the hour is a little late, but let's take uh, four questions, and then Tom will be around. You can ask him questions privately. So, um, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and be recognized. You have in front of you a microphone. So if you push the red button on the microphone, it will light up, and then um, you will have the floor. So please, anyone would like to ask a question? Oh, sorry. There's, there's a button. The button with the face on it. Please, would anyone like to ask a question? Sir. No, that, that's a good question. Um, so, well, so a couple of comments. The first is, since we haven't really found a form of dark matter yet, we don't really know. The oh, sorry, let me repeat the question. Uh, let me try to repeat the question. It was, I talked about the fact that in the early universe there was a little more matter than antimatter. How does that relate to the dark matter? Was the dark matter a little more anti-dark matter than matter? Can we learn about the amount of matter and antimatter from this? Okay, um, it's possible we'll learn something from this. In the normal WIMP story, we actually sort of assume that the WIMPs and the anti-WIMPs are, are, are very much equal. If the, in the normal WIMP story, meaning the calculations that make very specific predictions for how much dark matter there is, um, the, um, if the WIMPs and anti-WIMPs were like normal matter where there was an imbalance only at a part in 10 to the 11th, uh, that imbalance is really, um, the amount left over is much greater than that. And we might have a slight, a slight amount more WIMPs than anti-WIMPs, uh, but there's many more of both of them than there is than the difference. Um, there are other types of theories for the dark matter where actually they assume that the dark matter and the anti-dark matter is exactly like the normal matter and antimatter, And it's a different mechanism, at least on paper, to generate the WIMPs or the dark matter. So I don't think I exactly answered your question. Thing is, you can either mix the WIMP ups in that story or not. In the normal WIMP story, you don't mix them up in that story. There are other versions of dark matter where you do. And I should say other methods that look for those other kinds of models of dark matter. Yeah. Uh, some of my colleagues here, some other colleagues are involved in that. Um, other questions? Uh, please. Okay, so you've been saying that all these experiments are really fun to do. Is it, um, why do you think this is important and how will it be used? Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's, at some level, it's like, why did the man climb or the person climb the mountain? Because it was there, right? I mean, for us, it's important because it's there. You know, I, I started with Newton because... And I told such a story of cosmology to convey that it's just really incredible that, um, that the cosmos are understandable and so much of the history of the Big Bang is related to what we've learned in particle physics. And we've got this story which is compelling from a particle physics perspective and from the Big Bang perspective 
but there's this huge piece which is missing. It's just this incredible, compelling story from a physics perspective. And to my mind, that's, that, that sells itself. I mean, much of physics is just a journey of discovery. Why do we do astronomy? You know, when we study galaxies far, far, far away, that's never going to be practical. But we all kind of agree those pictures are beautiful and it's interesting that the cosmos is out there and we study it. This is kind of part of that. You know, there's a standard story, which is absolutely true, which is the students and postdocs that we train, they go out and they go into industry and they do all sorts of, you know, great things, even if they're not doing this. Um, this is not an area where finding dark matter per se is going to lead to a new energy source. This is an incredibly ghostly stuff that doesn't really interact with our world. And so we're, we're, we're studying the dark matter question for knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, but we're part of an enterprise which has a lot of, you know, side benefits. Uh, so, th my question is, um, is, the big colliders, would they origin emitting uh, dark matter particles? Is it, is it possible to, to detect? Or I almost should let Michael answer this one. You want to answer this one? Yeah, I'll answer this one. So, um, yes, in many of the models that were discussed, including some of the ones that were way down under the neutrino floor, it's predicted that the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is producing lots of dark matter. Of course, dark matter is very weakly interacting. It's basically invisible. And so it's very difficult to figure out whether dark matter is being produced. But every once in a while, if you're producing dark matter, you should produce it in combination with other things. For example, two quarks come together. They make dark matter particles and they radiate some gluons or photons, and you can look for that. So this is an investigation going on in parallel. Um, what we really hope is that Tom and his friends will find signals of dark matter coming from space, and these other groups, uh, with whom we're also strongly involved, will find dark matter coming from accelerators, and then we can take the pieces and put them together. But so far, nobody's had any luck. And it's just a big mystery. Okay, last question. Uh, repeat the question, please. Okay, but we should also let that fellow do one more after that, because the two two people answered, and one, the one guy was the guy's waiting. <laughs> okay, so but your question was, if you add up all the neutrinos, how does that how does their mass compare to the dark matter? Yes. All the neutrinos are comparable to the observed stars, which are a fraction of the actual normal matter, which is mostly gas, and the dark matter is seven times that. So the dark matter is, I'm not enough of a cosmologist, I think 50 or so times all neutrinos, not a million, not two, but some number like 100 or 50 or something like that. More dark matter than neutrinos. And the neutrinos are, 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 because they're very light, they don't grow structure. They relativistically stream out of clumps. So they're not the dark matter. And then, one more, because this guy, with the. Um, about, um, I don't know. 20 years ago in FizRev letters, there was tracking uh, data from the Voyager, and it was going slower than they expected. NASA did tracking data around, um, slingshotting around uh, Jupiter, mm -hmm. and they, I mean, it possibly could have been evidence of dark matter on the scale of, you know, the Voyager. Um, is that... Um, been verified, and they also thought there might be a velocity component to the um, tracking errors. Yeah, I think so. That's, that's interesting. So let me just try to answer quickly in two parts. The, the specific thing, this, you know, satellite that was way out there and had an anomaly, Sad, you know, people got really excited, but sadly, I think it turned out to be mundane. It was like, I think, some heating cooling thing with some emission of very faint radiation, thermal radiation that slowed it down in one direction or another. I don't remember the details, but it, it went away. But a, a broader question is, 
could dark matter be discovered? Could the effects of dark matter be measured in the lab setting or even on the, let's call the, uh, the solar system a lab? And the answer is basically no, because the evidence for dark matter that we see in the galaxies, as, as I kind of explained, um, you know, the, 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 the Milky Way is embedded in a bunch of dark matter. Locally, the dark matter is just uniform in all directions, and there's not much of it. In fact, the density of dark matter locally is about the density of the faint gas in interstellar space. It just adds up to dominate the galaxy because it's so much bigger. So locally, it just doesn't have an effect gravitationally. You know, that it, just, it wasn't showing up on the short scale, short meaning this here to Pluto, and um, it's just not showing up, and you know, so you can't, you can look for the particles if it's particle-like in the lab, but you can't measure the, the gravity effects any other way except getting a big telescope. Well, uh, let's thank Tom very much again. Okay. Um, the next one of these lectures will be at the end of January. We'll have a talk on the birth and life of galaxies. And so I hope to see you then. Um, if you'd like to ask Tom more questions, he'll be out in the lobby in just a minute after he's cleaned up, and he'll be around for a while, so stick around. Thank you very much.